So, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, a big thank you to Capital Link for setting up this uh, very interesting, I believe, panel on the outlooks and prospects of Greek banking. We will start with some introductory remarks from Christos Megalou. Christos is the CEO of Piraeus Bank. And then we will move um, on our panel discussion with our distinguished panelists. So, Christos. Good, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, thank you for being with us after lunch. Always a challenging uh, uh, time for a conference. I'll try to be quick and uh, I'll try to set the scene for a very interesting panel that uh, I would like to follow and uh, say a few things, a few remarks about the Greek banking sector. And I remember being here in conference uh, year after year, especially some of the uh, most difficult years for uh, Greece and Greek banking. And I can tell you for sure that uh, uh, Greek banking has been through a, a great transformation and has uh, delivered uh, and, uh, a, a results that uh, nobody believed that uh, they will be able to come, uh, especially if you were to think about the years of the crisis. If we were to, to, to remember uh, a few years back, non-performing loans were 110 billion euros at their peak in early 2016. I remember 57 billion in 2017 were the Piraeus Bank non-performing loans. And Right now, a total number of less than 18 billion of non-performing loans by the end of 2021, a, a lot less for uh, Piraeus Bank, and uh, going into 2022, single-digit non-performing loan numbers uh, expected for all the Greek banks. A significant achievement which uh, happened over the last few years that uh, I think it's uh, recognized in a European uh, or even global scale, the level of uh, uh, the scaling of non performing loans in a systemic uh, 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 European country. Now, for Piraeus Bank, uh, we ended up the year at 12.5% NP loans, going into 8% for this year and 3% uh, uh, very soon to come, below European average. Liquidity for the Greek banking system restored completely and ratios and, uh, uh, and liquidity are extremely strong for all the Greek banks. The ratings, credit ratings of the, of the Greek banks have been uh, upgraded multiple times over uh, the past few years. And uh, following the Hellenic Republic, uh, hopefully the return into the investment grade in 2023 will gradually follow into that path as well for all the Greek banking system. Operating profitability has been gradually recovering and at the back of what uh, seems to be an above average European uh, level economic growth for Greece, it is expected that credit uh, will increase and it is expected that given the fact that the non-performing loans are less of a problem for, for Greek bank managements, the management team's focus will be on performance and on profitability. And this is what is happening right now. In 2021, significant strengthening of the capital buffers took place. Our own uh, 1.4 billion equity share capital increase. Alpha Bank has done the same. Uh, also, good capital uh, uh, level ratios for, uh, uh, for Greek banks. Significant improvement in capital allowed the banking sector to clean up and allowed uh, to set the scene for what is happening in 2022. And what do we see is happening in 2022? We see 
profitability taking center stage. We see innovative moves uh, that uh, uh, have been initiated already, moves like uh, uh, our own move into uh, the asset management business, where we expect uh, that we will be in a position to uh, grow significantly our fee pool over the last few years, the move into uh, good quality real estate uh, by uh, us, but also Eurobank, and, and uh, a, a theme that is happening in, uh, in uh, the Greek market, the push for uh, reducing uh, uh, OPEX uh, and the push for profitability to come in a, in a grand way into the Greek uh, banking system. And these, these are trends that are expected to continue. And I'm very happy to say that uh, we at Piraeus Bank, we are in the forefront of these initiatives with both organic and inorganic moves in trying to deliver uh, on the bottom line for our shareholders. Of course, there are headwinds, and uh, we have seen the Russian invasion in Ukraine created an abnormal situation that exacerbated uh, what was a quite uh, intense inflationary environment. And uh, we all expect to uh, uh, address uh, significant in inflation uh, this year and possibly uh, the years to come. Uh, however, we are, at least in the case of Greece, uh, quite confident that this is not going to derail the growth uh, uh, prospects. And we do expect, not only us, but also uh, the IMF, uh, the European Commission, growth which uh, could uh, look something like 3 to 4 percent, 1.5 to 2 percent above European average uh, for uh, uh, 2022. And, uh, and, and, and growth to continue uh, beyond. So in this environment, in an environment of growth, we are optimistic about the Greek banking system. There has been quite a lot of transformation that took place the last few years under difficult uh, uh, market uh, uh, conditions. We are now at the turning point where profitability is taking uh, center stage, and, uh, and, uh, and we now owe it to all those uh, people that have been following the market, to our shareholders and to our stakeholders, to deliver on uh, the profitability uh, uh, side. And this is what the Greek banks are uh, going to be focusing in uh, the next few years to come. And with that remark, uh, George, I leave it to you to uh, guide this uh, uh, super panel of top professionals that uh, you have on your left. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christo. And, and this really sets the scene for the discussion that will follow with our distinguished panelists. So over the next 45 minutes or so, we will have the chance to uh, discuss on the growth and outlook of Greek banking within this perfect store environment that we all experienced following the Russian invasion in Ukraine. We'll have the chance to combine both internal perspectives from Greek banking executives, but also get outside experts' uh, view from uh, people that come from investment banking world, consulting world, or the supervisor. So let me briefly introduce you, our panelists. From my left, uh, Lazarus Papagrifalou, the CFO of Alpha Bank. Next to him, Christos Christodoulou, the CFO of National Bank of Greece. Next to him, Jose Manuel Gasaya, partner at Oliver Wyman. Uh, Theodor Nardelis, the CFO of Piraeus Bank. Ms. Elizabeth McCall, uh, from the supervisory board of uh, the European Central Bank. And Luca Majorana, uh, from the Financial Institutions Group Emerging uh, uh, European Markets of Barclays. So let us start maybe with uh, an outside view and uh, starting with you, uh, Luca. Uh, you, you have worked extensively in Greece over the recent, uh, the recent past, but also other European, European markets. So, so what is your view on the 
really on the progress of the Greek banking system as an outsider and where you see uh, the Greek banks should focus on, on the future to improve their equity story. Thank you. Um, Yorgo, let me start first to thank the um, whole Capital Link organization for the invitation, and it's great to be part of um, this esteemed panel. Um, connecting to what Mr. Magalius mentioned, I think, to set the scene, there are a couple of trends, micro trends, that we need to mention. I think, Kelly, the perfect storm resulting from the combination of the pandemic and the war in Ukraine is changing the economic paradigm that we've been used to over the years. So, Kelly, from globalization to deglobalization. Equally, the second trend that we need to notice, which is important to consider when we look at the European banking space, is the energy transition. So clearly, Europe has to transition as fast as possible to renewables and decrease the reliance on Russian gas. And these will come at a cost, right? These two trends, the deglobalization and uh, the energy transition, are both inflationary factors, right? So when we think about the European central banks and the global central banks, we see effectively that uh, they need to implement policies that bring to an end to the <coughs> sum zero uh, interest rate policies. And this, in a way, is, um, is a positive in part for the banks, as this will provide resiliency to the PL of, uh, of the banks from an NII perspective. At the same time, I think when we look at the European banking space, we need to consider another fundamental factor, right, which is central in, uh, in the future operation and the strategies of, of the European banks and the Greek banks which is the emergence and, and the centrality of, of fintech. So from the master use of data analytics, artificial intelligence, the implementation of blockchain, uh, machine learning, all of these will significantly reshape uh, the banking space and effectively will potentially bring to an increase in productivity and, and profitability. So, this is an environment, a changing environment, which might be challenging for, for the banks as they operate. However, having said all of that, you know, the, notwithstanding this changing environment, the, the Greek banks have made tremendous progress over the last uh, uh, few years, and they certainly represent uh, a true success story in, in, in the European banking space, the perfect you know, textbook um, a special case. In fact, as, as mentioned previously by, by Mr. Megalou, if we consider the progress that the Greek banks have, have done over the last you know, five, six years, this is, has been impressive. The NPA deleverage, you know, the NPA ratio has gone down from 50% uh, uh, a few years back, close to almost single digit as we speak. So this is incredibly important when we look at the environment where the Greek banks are operating. And of course, this has been executed on the back of the apps, uh, apps regulation, the apps stream, which has been very conducive. At the same time, notwithstanding the leverage, the Greek banks have continued to perform well across the board. So I think a couple of points to mention. Um, the first one, the Greek banks have been able to tap into the debt and equity capital markets. Last year, I think this is a fundamental factor. We've seen the capital increase by Alpha Bank, Piraeus Bank, this clearly has as, as, as broad um, uh, strength to the sector. The second one is the Greek banks have turned their attention to organic profitability and new business opportunities. So this is another factor to, to consider when we look at the Greek banks. They've increased volumes, both from a loan disbursement perspective and asset gathering perspective which of course supports you know, the, the growth of the core profitability of the banks. And therefore, on the back of improved profitability, equity raising, and uh, capital accredited transaction, the sector has strengthened its capital position. And this is fairly important when we look at the current environment. You know, uh, in an environment of uncertainty, of geopolitical changes, having such, um, um, coming from a such um, a strong position, Kelly helps the bank to navigate well the current environment. So to your question, to your initial question, how the Greek bank can enhance their equity story in, in the current environment, I think has you know, Greece exit a decade of the leverage, the new phase of growth will be effectively investment driven. And the Greek banks will play a critical role, a crucial role in this. So um, the Greek banks are in pole position to capitalize on uh, uh, the recovery 
and their profitability, in my view, will be driven by mainly three factors. One is um, long growth, as I mentioned, will allow to support the NII, of course, rising interest rate would be a positive for the PNL and the resiliency of the bank. The second one is the expansion of the fee business. Mr. Megalo mentioned asset management. I think about innovation in digital banking. I think about payments. So all of the banks have implemented their uh, strategies around merchant acquiring, and therefore that, that business is supportive of um, um, fee generation. And the last point, I think, is uh, the optimization of the cost base. And that will come through the embracing the adoption of fintech and uh, artificial intelligence. So from my perspective, um, clearly the banks have switched their focus from running the banks to growing the banks. Effectively, we have seen it uh, last, last week in uh, the context of the business plan presentation by Piraeus, the other banks in the context of uh, the annual uh, result presentation. So I think definitely the outlook for the Greek banks remains extremely positive, and, and growth will be the key thematic in, uh, in the quarters to come. Thank you. Thank you very much, Luca. And, and turning uh, for a while on the war situation, Jose Manuel, uh, we have seen recently a very interesting report from Oliver Wyman describing the effects of uh, rising invasion and war in Ukraine for European banking. C could you give us your perspective of what you believe to be, in summary, the main effects of this situation for European, but also Greek banks? Yeah. So it, it's, it's going to be, it's going to changing, it's going to be changing a lot of the decisions that banks are going to have to make in the, in the, in the coming months, right? It's going to affect credit decisions, it's going to affect footprint decisions, it's going to affect sanctions. So if you look at it structurally, oh, hopefully better. So if you look at it structurally, um, every area of the bank is going to have to make decisions in a different way than it was doing a couple of months ago, right? Starting from a sanctions space in which uh, you got different countries providing similar but not equivalent type of sanctions, and you have to have a, a live team monitoring all of that. that. That's something you didn't have to have management bandwidth in the, in the past, and now it has become critical and central to what every, what every bank has to do. You, you also have to decide, not a big problem here in, in Greek banks about Russian footprints, but for other, for other European players, it's, it's a critical decision. How do you do that? Who you give that exposure to, right? A, a little bit going down the line, you still have, you still have the, the securities in which you might have invested, and you need to get your treasury teams to, to efficiently try to do that, and it's almost impossible because you don't have the ability to, to dispose of them. Um, and, and normally, either through some companies, international companies, you also have credit exposure. How do you manage that existing credit exposure? How do you manage the risk that you have in there? And so you, you've touched on the Treasury Department, you've touched on the compliance departments, you've touched on almost everyone. And if that was not sufficient, we now have cyber risks that were unexpectedly uh, growing because of, because of all the of all the way war happens now. So you also get all your technology teams to have to, to be on top of, of, of if you get attacked or if um, some of your clients get attacked, right? And, and just that is first order effects. So that's just managing the, the, the things that will directly hit you. But if you look at the second order effects, you, you start with a completely different macroeconomic perspective. What do I do now? We've all touched upon inflation. Um, how, how do we prepare for that, right? Um, the second one is energy. Uh, all of the banks have significant exposure to the energy sector. How do you manage that exposure? How do you manage both it local, but, uh, but also the international expansion? And, and what, do you, what do you do with the ongoing projects that you have, right? Um, and then, if, if that was not sufficient, you have to think of, of things like what's going to happen with SWIFT, right? Um, is it going to finally break into a multiple system? And how do we keep on um, processing international payments? Um, and because payments are struggling, what you see is, is, is crypto becoming more central to many of the equations. So again, another thing that probably would have taken more time to develop, you're seeing a lot of movement in that space. Um, and then partly you end up in a different world. So geopolitically, not only from an economic perspective, you are looking into a world that looks completely different to what you had <clears throat> half a year ago. So, so this is going to require significant, significant bandwidth from all the senior executive of all the banks. Um, it's, it's not an easy task ahead of them. Thank you. Thank you, Jose Manuel. And turning now to our uh, CFOs, uh, we could maybe deep dive a bit further on the Greek banking outlook, uh, starting firstly with the top line. 
So one of the key questions, I think, for many is where the value will come from now and in the future. Uh, what is a realistic credit expansion for the market? Where this expansion should focus on? Uh, what is the outlook for fees and commissions in the Greek market? Uh, so, Christos, could you share your perspective on what you believe will be the priorities and focus areas for the years to come on the top line in the Greek banking system? Thank you, George. Uh, effectively, <coughs> Christos and Luca kind of touched uh, on, the, on the drivers going forward. So the, the primary driver for growth is our own, on top line income is primarily the anticipated credit expansion of the Greek economy. Um, the fundamentals of the Greek economy are strong following the prolonged crisis that we had um, for many years. And effectively, we had a great 2021 with the GDP ending at 8.3% for the year. Uh, the support of the government was there with key fiscal measures to keep things going and to overcome whatever challenges the pandemic uh, laid upon us. Currently, we still face challenges, but the Greek economy remains in a growth mode. And despite the geopolitical tensions and the persistent inflation, with the GDP growth expected to be still at about 3.5%, with the view that we have today, uh, while the euro area is around 2%, expectations are at 2%, is going to be the driver going forward. Uh, it's interesting to, to share a statistic to show the potential that the Greek market has. Pre-crisis, we had about 110% uh, of performing balances over GDP. Today, the same metric is 60% with a much less GDP. So if things grow the way we expect them to be, it shows that there is potential to grow our performing loans, which are going to be the key driver for NII. Um, another aspect which is technical with regards to growing NII is, of course, the base rate. We've been living in a negative pay, uh, interest rate environment for some time. So uh, if the expected hypes in interest rates happen, as people predict in the, in the coming years, that on its own will also boost the NII, the top line uh, for the banking institutions. Now, the banks need to support the economy. We need to be there to give money to, to businesses and households so that we help them grow. And one thing will lead to the other. We have an RF, the Recovery and Resilience Fund, uh, 30 billion euros of funds will flood the Greek economy over the next years. And it's not just that. We have the multiplier effects because uh, we have also the equity from the borrowers and the, and the gearing from the bank, which will, in effect, increase the 30 billion to over 50 over the next years. And inevitably, it will flood the economy and the, and the growth prospects of the country, and the loan granting will, be, uh, will, will improve. Now, you talked about the top line, but also we have the fees. Uh, Luca uh, said interesting things about the fees. Um, credit expansion and the loan origination will be a driver going forward for fees. But it's not just that. I think the way forward is to focus on non-credit related fees. So we have ample liquidity in Greece. The banks are in a very good position uh, with regards to liquidity at this point in time. And we need to find clever ways to divert this liquidity into investment products, bank insurance products, so that we generate fees and meet our European peers. Because as things stand, the Greek banks are below par with regards to uh, other banks in Europe in the fee income uh, spectrum. So there are many actions to be done, but the key driver, I would say, George, is the economy. We need to uh, keep going and to uh, tap the potential that the growth story of Greece has to offer us. Th thank you, Christo. And maybe a follow-up question, uh, talking about expansion and the better economic outlook. Uh, some years ago, the, the footprint of Greek banking uh, from the geographic perspective was much, much wider. Uh, so in this new environment, do you see that uh, there is potential for geographical expansion again of the Greek banks, or the focus we believe on the next years should be mostly uh, within the country? MNAs are about synergies and returning value to the shareholder. So, in my mind, going forward, the, the, 
the M&A uh, route is going to be somewhat different. We've seen uh, all the Greek banks tapping on, um, on the potential of partnerships. So we should uh, find uh, experts in the areas of payments, in the areas of, um, of digital offerings, in wealth management, and to partner with, with them to grow. That's a form of, of M&A. Um, I, I think the, the, the old uh, way of uh, you know, bricks and mortar uh, m and it's a thing of the past. It needs to be a unique opportunity that's uh, worth the money to go down that road. So in my mind, is a growth in the future in, uh, in, from in organic actions needs to be clever, and it should, uh, in a way, uh, enable the, the Greek banks to export their expertise uh, and their uh, digital offering. Uh, that's how I, I see this uh, going forward in the future. Th thank you, Christo. And, and before we close uh, the top line, maybe one more question, uh, Jose Manuel, for you. Uh, uh, Luca discussed a bit as well on, on, on digital and, and innovation agenda. Uh, and, and we have seen globally the fintechs, you know, attacking the incumbent uh, traditional players and eating up profitable market share uh, from them. Uh, but we have not quite seen that happening in, in the Greek market. Uh, could you share your perspective on why this is so and if we should expect uh, a change in that trend over the next years? I think there were there were good reasons for 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 Greece not to be right now in the center of the fintechs. Right, um, language is a strong barrier when you when you have to expand internationally. Um, I myself that have lived there for seven years and still speak very few words. Uh, it's not a trivial it's not a trivial thing. Right. Um, beyond that, the market was in a in a in a difficult position with with very high levels of NPLs and and that and that was a risk for for all those fintechs trying to come to a market. Do you want to come into a market in which people are are being debanked. So, so, and on top of that, VC is very still in the early stages in, in, in Greece. We're, we're seeing uh, incredible things happening, but we're seeing early stage uh, companies now in Greece. We're still not seeing round A, round B companies that were, that's the spot in which someone like a fintech could, could consider Greece, right? So, so we had a difficult country to enter. We had not sufficient fund specializes in doing that. And we had a, a, a situation that was difficult to understand for those fintechs with, with those high levels of NPLs, even though they only operate in the, in the payment space initially but but it was it, it did not present as the most attractive way to, to go in um, if you were expanding internationally a lot of those things I'd say all of them have changed and are different um, we are seeing a lot of the transactions that are happening in the market in the payment space we've seen many many of the people that are here in this table um, have experienced them and now have uh, joint ventures as, as Christos was saying um, and we're seeing that the Greek economy which was very cash-based prior to the pandemic has drastically digitalized. Uh, I remember going there two, three years ago, and many places you had to pay only with cash, and now every single thing that you want, you can pay it in, in with a credit card, right? Those little things are very relevant for someone like a fintech trying to come into the market. So I do expect uh, a, a, a change of that historical uh, lack of fintechs in the country. Thank you. Thank you, Jose Manuel. And, and turning now to asset quality, Theodore, uh, this has been obviously a key area of focus for Greek banks over the recent years with very impressive uh, results that have been mentioned from, from the previous speakers. Uh, at this point, and following this mass cleaning of the balance sheet, uh, where do you believe that the priorities will focus on now uh, for the Greek banks? And, and what are your expectations in terms of key asset quality metrics of the Greek banks over the next couple of years? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> first of all, it is refreshing to be talking about asset quality um, in this situation, right? It would have been a very different discussion a couple of years ago. Um, I think Luca mentioned the three drivers for the equity story. Not one of them was cost of risk, um, which is a great place to be. Uh, uh, we got here through a lot of work um, and uh, definitely through the uh, strong leadership that the Republic and the official sector show by introducing Hercules, um, at, which accelerated the whole story and got us to where we are today, which is practically um, a drop to, I think the four systemic banks between them are like a 10% story and, and, uh, and, and all of us moving towards the, the single digit ratio. So a great place to be, <clears throat> but staying at that great place is what matters now. 
Um, we do have headwinds. Um, the MP inflows and the new generation of MPEs and how that will play out is important. Um, uh, and, and the resulting factor of that is really cost of risk. Right? I mean, we have, uh, the job is largely done. We have been able to achieve um, uh, uh, low cost of risk levels. Um, we're not exactly at European levels, but very close to them uh, in the 70, 80 base point range already. Um, staying at those levels is, uh, uh, is kind of important. Import so monitoring the probability of default, uh, uh, staying at the inflow levels that uh, we have seen. We saw record low inflows. Uh, Piraeus Bank had like 100 million in, uh, in Q4, a similar number in Q3. Q1 looking pretty good, but the word is still out um, as to how um, the situation is going gonna, is gonna to play out. So keep the low probability of default, stop a new generation of, uh, uh, of MPEs happening, um, and, and sustain the cost of risk uh, that we have uh, enjoyed over the last uh, few quarters. Thank you. Thank you very much, Theo. And, and talking about these this headwinds that you mentioned, uh, g given the, uh, the recent war in Ukraine, what is your first view, uh, if there is already some kind of view on, on any specific asset class effects in terms of asset quality uh, challenges? Uh, and do you see any, any changes already in the risk appetite, any respective tightening of uh, the credit policies to, to reflect more prudence? Is that or, or not? Well, first of all, on your last point, quite the opposite. Um, we've been talking about credit expansion largely. God forbid we're going to start constraining underwriting. The, the, the opposite of that, right? We need to, to expand our horizons. Uh, we're not going to be underwriting loans the way we have been in the past. Uh, we need to address a large part of, uh, um, of society that uh, has been in a non-performing era, and that's a new thing. Uh, so we can't be doing things the same way there. And there's also a new generation of, uh, of, of people that are probably not very attracted or attractive to banks. So to, to your last part of the question, quite the opposite. Now, to the headwinds. I mean, we need to remember two things, right? It's still a growth story. We're taking a bit of a, you know, a, a, a dip of a breather, but it's still a growth story. Greece is going to be growing over the coming years. Um, and, and the other thing to remember is that the performing books of banks have been through a lot of stressing. Uh, so we're talking about really resilient exposures. We saw that also in the um, COVID pandemic. I mean, the, the discussion of 2021 was moratoria. What's going to happen with moratoria? How many of that is going to default? Percentages were flying around. 20% are going to default, not 25%. What if it's 30%? In the end, it was 10%. Again, thanks to a lot of support that was given. So the level of support that will be given now will also affect a little bit the story. But anyway, what we're looking at and the sensitivities that we have run will affect uh, um, uh, some parts of the loan book. Uh, we know this. Uh, retail is definitely going to come under stress. The disposable income effect um, uh, is going to be a, uh, is going to be an issue. Inflation. Uh, um, will affect disposable income and might create some additional defaults. Um, also, particular sectors of the economy, manufacturing, cost of goods sold uh, is going to compress margins, um, and that could create some additional inflows. But either way, all sensitivities right now, given the macro predictions, are not speaking of a new tsunami of MPEs, right? But every year counts. Um, uh, we're not going to leave uh, 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 anything on the table. And, um, and, and as I said before, managing those, uh, uh, those uh, uh, kind of cases that might come um, uh, under uh, stress um, is of utmost priority. Thank you. Thank you very much, Theo. And uh, now turning to the third pillar of our discussion, uh, this is you know, cost side, yeah? And the internal transformation that has happened in the Greek banking extensively over the last years. So, so Lazare, to you, um, what is your view on the current position of the Greek banks in terms of cost efficiency? And where do you think the efforts will need to be focused now so as to release uh, more costs in the future? Thank you, George. Good afternoon. I believe that the uh, positioning of Greek banks uh, relative to the rest of the Europe in managing costs is pretty solid. And um, there are several 
structural, um, historical, and forward-looking elements that we should consider in explaining that positioning. To start with, there has been a very significant consolidation in the banking system that has happened through uh, the crisis. Um, uh, smaller marginal players uh, have exited the market. Same goes with uh, uh, foreign uh, players. So as the banks have remained behind and have consolidated their presence in the market, um, enjoy uh, uh, good margins and um, uh, efficiency in their operations. Um, let's remind ourselves that prior to the sovereign crisis, you had um, um, uh, a lot uh, of financial institutions in the market. It was quite fragmented. Now you have uh, five banks controlling 97 percent of uh, the banking um, assets. Alpha has been uh, active in this respect. We have acquired uh, operations of Credit Agricole in Greece, Citibank, retail operations, and we have managed to create good synergies out of these transactions. Um, the second element uh, to look at is uh, the restructuring uh, plans that Greek banks have uh, delivered. First, that was a commitment to the European Commission uh, to become more lean and efficient. When we received state aid, we had to uh, materialize uh, restructuring plans. But the banks, uh, based on their own plans and efforts, they have doubled up during this period of introversy uh, to become uh, more efficient. Uh, take, for example, us. Uh, we have managed to uh, decrease costs from 1.5 billion to less than 1 billion uh, euro for our Greek and uh, international operations, and we now operate with half the branches and workforce uh, compared to where we started a few years ago. And that's not the end of the journey, um, quite the contrary. When we announced our uh, business plan, we explained that a good part of operating expenses um, related to the management of the bad bank, uh, uh, the problematic assets in the balance sheet. Almost 15 percent of costs um, uh, contributed to, to the cost base. And given the huge deleveraging effort of the last year, um, we're going to see the benefits already flowing into the PNL. Uh, of this year, 2022, where we are targeting a significant reduction of expenses on the back of asset deleveraging, as well as the deleveraging of non-core businesses like merchant acquiring, uh, where we partner with Nexi. The second, the third element uh, to, to consider is the role of uh, digital strategies. Uh, it is clear that the uh, remote channels outpace physical channels. In terms of transactions, no more than 5 percent of uh, transactions happen in the branch network, whereas the role of um, uh, web banking and mobile has increased considerably. Um, in 2021 only, uh, our web transactions increased by 5 percent, whereas the mobile transactions increased by 55 percent. Uh, one third of um, individual clients on board now digitally, and the same goes for corporate customers. It's one third. Uh, in digital sales, we see similar trends. Um, a, a good part of uh, debit cards and the deposit accounts are sold through digital uh, means. So uh, this is uh, happening. Um, it has started quite a few years ago, and there is still uh, I think way uh, to go. Uh, I may say that we may lag uh, compared to other more advanced systems, but this is exactly uh, the opportunity uh, for Greek banks. And another important development is the fact that the Greek government has championed the digital transformation of the economy during the pandemic. So that is changing behaviors of, of citizens, increases satisfaction and um, awareness 
and that again informs our business models uh, with regards to, to, to digital. There are additional levers uh, that we work on to reduce costs, um, like for example the optimization of processes, workspace optimization and introduction of new ways of work, uh, more uh, um, uh, disciplined vendor management uh, and management of procurement expenses, organization delayering to become more uh, efficient at the head office level, uh, usage of data analytics in order to become more focused in sales and marketing, um, and on the back of uh, these initiatives, we're targeting good savings to happen within the business plan um, horizon. So uh, I think the picture I'm, I'm painting is, is quite clear. You have an industry structure uh, which is conducive of efficient operations. During the crisis, weak banks have made their homework uh, to become more efficient and with the usage of technology and uh, the expansion of uh, remote networks, there is more efficiency gains to, to reap uh, in the next few years. Thank you, Lazar. And, and maybe a follow-up uh, question on that. Do you see any um, effects of uh, the current war events in Ukraine on your cost transformation journey and, uh, and efforts? Like, I don't know, inflation pushing up uh, uh, the peril cost for, for people or, or other effects? Uh, we do see uh, uh, some inflationary pressure on uh, expenses. Um, you will appreciate, though, that uh, energy prices and in the, uh, the price of material is not a significant part of our cost base. Um, the cost of plastic, energy bills, gas transportation, things like that uh, are more expensive uh, in, in the context. Um, more important for us is uh, uh, wages and inflationary pressures on on staff expenses. There, I think uh, there are three things to consider. The first is that uh, there was a significant development in the last few weeks. There was an agreement with uh, the union uh, for the collective labor agreement for the next three years, locking in 5.5% uh, increases in, in staff costs in a backloaded manner. I think that the short-term uh, impact is, is very small, whereas the medium-term impact is very manageable in the context, a reasonable outcome for uh, the union and, and the banks. It is important because we're locking this uh, significant uh, driver of costs uh, in an inflationary environment. The second is, uh, again, digital and uh, the fact that uh, physical channels are becoming uh, less uh, important. So we have further efficiency gains in terms of the uh, FTE base in our operations. Alpha has the, the smallest uh, uh, workforce uh, in, in, uh, in Greece, uh, and we have plans uh, to bring further efficiency. So if that's the case for, the case for us, it's the same case for uh, our peers. So good prospects there. Uh, to counterbalance any inflationary pressures on, on wages. And third is that inflation <coughs> is not coming in a, in a policy vacuum. Uh, there are other fiscal and monetary um, uh, policies that affect our balance sheet in a positive manner, counterbalancing uh, the impact of uh, inflation. Uh, in, in the last decade, um, <coughs> we have seen uh, banks in a negative or zero inflationary environment, uh, focusing on cost reduction on an absolute basis. I think this is, this is coming to an end, uh, given the growth that we're facing in the Greek economy. Focus should be given, as far as efficiency is concerned, on uh, operating JOS uh, and cost of income, uh, where you know all banks have reported in a difficult year in 2021 an average cost income of 50 percent, and despite this is transitional uh, period, uh, if you look at the consensus for the next few years, uh, it's for a cost income anywhere between 40 to 50 percent, which is a good place to be as a banking system overall. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lazare. And Elizabeth, turning to, to you now, 
um, we have this kind of uh, evolving war in our backyard in, in Europe and uh, a number of repercussions on economies, on sectors, on, on banks, as, as we discussed. And, and this crisis follows another crisis, the pandemic crisis that, that we had the last couple of years. And at that point, we had seen uh, the supervisor responding to, to the pandemic crisis with a number of measures to support the banking system, uh, including capital relief, but not only. Uh, so the question is, what should we expect from uh, uh, the supervisory point of view um, given this new uh, crisis? Um, and, and how the war situation, if you will, affects the supervisory priorities of ECB? Thank you, thank you. First, I, I make two personal comments, if that's okay. First one is I'm just delighted to see everyone here in person in New York, and I am really happy that we were able to have this rescheduled event with such incredible attendance, so congratulations. Thank you for inviting me. The second is um, just to tell you, you can tell from my accent, I'm, I'm an American. I'm, I live in New York. I am the first American to serve on the European Central Bank Supervisory Board, and for me, it's it's an incredible honor to do that. When I was a university student, I was uh, studying the common market in Germany um, as a study abroad student, and I, what I really learned was certainly about the need to have the free movement of goods and services across the European Union, and that that would be important for the economic well-being of the Union. But what I really learned was about peace. So seeing this war. Um, really has reinforced my passion for doing my service on the European Central Bank Board and deepening the banking union. And it's, it's horrifying to see this war. The human tragedy is, is just incredible. And it's the main point, really. Um, but now I, I turn to uh, the economic consequences and, and the impacts on the banking system. And of course, those are there. Um, you know, when we entered this period of time, just following, uh, you know, you're right, we've got twin crises, a pandemic into a war. But let me say that when we entered into the pandemic period, we had a banking sector which was characterized by very strong capital and liquidity positions, which man meant that we could really weather the storm quite appropriately. Um, we are now seeing, as we're, we're watching the, the impact of the war, that the initial direct impact of Russian exposure is really quite manageable across the European banking sector. And we don't see, um, you know, we really see a limited impact um, on, on the banking sector in that regard. And we're starting now, and I'll come back to this in a second, um, to look at really the medium-term risks and, and the, the second-level risks, which I think we don't know the whole story as yet. Um, we have seen, of course, a direct impact on uh, two banks, in particular, Spare Bank Europe, including the Croatian and the Slovenian subsidiaries, and uh, RCB Bank um, have had business models very focused on Russian business, and uh, these have been incredibly well managed, let me say, um, without a, 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 a very big impact on the banking sector, thank goodness. And so it's, um, it's a sign that the banking union itself is operating quite well. So that's a, that's a good thing. So we're monitoring the situation extremely closely. The, the bankers on the panel know that quite well. They're in very close touch with us. Um, and we are you know, really making sure that we will be quite vigilant in assessing what the second level effects will be. And uh, we will be very, very careful to focus in on any second level effects and be ready and agile to address those if there's a deterioration on a case-by-case -case basis in a, in a single bank as we go forward. Now, the supervisory priorities, we adopted those um, at the beginning of the year. We actually met in person in Brussels as a board, and we went through a very exhaustive process. And the good news is that um, our supervisory priorities um, are, are proving the test of time, actually. There were three things, really. We want to make sure that the banks emerge from the pandemic healthy, which means we're very focused on the credit processes in the banks. Second, that um, the banks continue to focus on um, structural deficiencies that were there really before the pandemic began, profitability, sustainability of business model, um, governance framework, strong governance framework as well. And then the third was that they'd be prepared to address new risks as they emerge, and climate risk, uh, the environmental impact and transition, cyber risks, and um, the, the uh, concern we have about 
the volatility in the marketplace, counterparty exposure, asset price correction. So you can see that these are really um, supervisor priorities that also apply very much um, to the situation with the war on the impact. And we are really going to be focused on the associated high volatility that we've seen in the commodities market um, and financial asset price corrections. So um, that's, a, that's going to continue to be very important for banks to have strong risk management processes in place um, so that they can cope with heightened interest rate environments and really volatility, which I think is the key thing. The second is the, the management of credit risk, and this was our top priority, number one, during the pandemic, and it will continue. Um, also with the effects of the war to be um, a, a number one priority for us. We are really going to be um, concerned about high indebtedness of corporates and households and the impact we'll want to see. Um, Theo, you mentioned uh, the, the increasing NPL inflows. This is, you know, we're really keeping a very close eye on this, and we want to make sure that the banks have strong credit mis risk management processes in place to early um, see early warning signs and to manage well. We're also seeing a big uptick, especially on lending, and that's a, that's a great thing. We want to make sure the underwriting standards are quite, um, are quite strong. So the last thing I would say here is um, I think all of us and supervisors at the top of the list need to be agile. I don't think we know this whole story yet and how, what the impacts will be, and ECB will be quite agile with the supervisory priorities in that regard. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. And, and the final question from, from my side, I mean, we have like uh, three uh, senior executives from Greek banks on the table. So any, any kind of specific um, messages or point of view uh, when it comes to, you know, what you believe should be the priorities of, of Greek banks over the next years when it comes to supervisory expectations yeah, from, from this angle? So the, the supervisory priorities I just mentioned obviously apply to the whole system, so they apply also to the Greek banks, and I, I'm sure that's not a surprise, um, including closely monitoring the geopolitical developments and what that means for the book of business um, that's in front of us. So that would be um, certainly a message that I, I would feel strongly about. Um, at the same time, in particular for the Greek banks, here we really need to make sure that the banks are continuing to address the legacy issues that they are entering. Uh, first the pandemic and then now this war period, um, which th 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 that there really continues to be progress made, um, especially by the larger Greek banks. And, you know, here I also need to say that um, also as, as an outsider coming to the ECB, I have found the progress on the non-performing exposures quite remarkable, quite commendable. Um, and it's also, it speaks to the working of the banking union, um, but it, it's really been, been really excellent progress. Um, more needs to happen, but, but excellent work so far. Um, We've seen uh, the massive balance sheet cleanup, and again, this is uh, good news as well, and it materially accelerated in 2021, which was a pleasant surprise in the midst of a, of a pandemic, and that was made possible mostly due to the securitizations that were able to be executed with the support of the Hercules Asset Protection Scheme. That was a, also a very good thing. Um, so these initiatives to improve the asset quality on the balance sheets, these have longer term effects and so very conscious decision to move ahead with these um, reductions in NPEs. Um, of course, that comes at a cost uh, of the capital positions and here this is where we need to remain uh, quite focused. It's, um, you know, it's going to be important that the banks continue to build up the management buffers and to um, strengthen the overall capital position because that's an area that um, you know, we'll, we'll definitely be very focused on. I, I, we're pleased that the NPEs have been reduced and that's a longer term strengthening of the balance sheet. Um, Credit risk remains a, a, a main focus for us. The Greek banks have made significant progress, 89 billion reduction, um, but again, and I mentioned it before, for the whole system, we want to make sure that the NPE inflows don't start to go up and that underwriting standards are continuing to remain quite strong. The NPE ratio in, in Greece is still the highest in Europe, and it's still a multiple of the European average, so this is a, a, quite a focus for us and very fundamental for us. Um, we want to make sure that the Greek banks are continuing to consider the implications of the COVID-19 measures as they're withdrawn. What is the impact on households and corporates, and how does that look going forward? And then on cost of risk, 
I'll, I'll be the one to mention that. Um, it remains a key point of attention and our expectations um, have been reiterated. We want to make sure that there's a shift from intense supervisory focus on legacy issues to the more standardized supervisory setting, more normalization, and that's, I would fully expect that we will um, land in that area. Capital adequacy is a focal point, um, and at the same time, we really want to make sure that with this market volatility, um, that we do continue the reductions that are taking place. And we've got some concern, will the hybrid instruments still be available for using? And then last, um, a focus on the sustainability of the business model, organic capital generation, the quality of owned funds. Um, these are the areas that we really want to make sure that we move toward generation of profits, um, we seize innovation and digitalization, and we continue cross-cutting. Thank you, Elizabeth. I see five seconds on my countdown clock, so it is the thank you time for our distinguished, sorry, for our distinguished panelists, and also to all of you for your attention. Thank you very much.